So how's life these days in uh, the office? A switch up. Yeah, it's it's good. I'm not in there every day. Um, excuse me, I sound very. Con- I I I normally sound congested, but I sound particularly <laughs> congested today. <laughs> I'm like a snotty teenager, but yeah, life's good. Uh, I started a new role recently with a company called FIS. So it's like the the leading fintech company in the world, which is pretty cool. Fifty five thousand employees, trying to find my my footing in there is uh, at the moment I'm six weeks into it, loving the challenge, and uh, I'm only going in once a week, so it's not too onerous. Uh, they're quite flexible where you work from. Nice one, and um, yeah, it's definitely a bit of a challenge. I'd say switching up from going training to having to kind of be on the clock for on a laptop for six eight hours a day maybe more <clears throat> yeah it is i weirdly though i kind of enjoy it um i'm enjoying the challenge of like becoming an expert or getting good at something new um so i don't mind it like uh, this there's loads of things i'm learning at the moment like they've got you these these um these sales onboarding courses like what it's called license to sell so you you got two or three hours a week with these like sales experts that are taking you through all these different methodologies to how to sell which is fascinating the psychology of it then i've been brought into my first deal this week so i'm learning how to use the pricing calculator you know i'm sitting in on like quite a few different sales people's calls and you're learning different things about how they position themselves and their product and how they get information out of their clients because that's the most important thing and then you're also learning how to like you know uh, how to present yourself internally like you need to build your own internal personal personal brand in these big companies or else you can get lost very quickly so it's all it's all new to me um but i'm loving the challenge it's great and it's funny like like it almost be so boring like just slamming emails and that on 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 your laptop all day but to me it's like i i've i spent hours i used typically when i was playing i'd spend hours a day on social media on facebook on instagram on twitter you just do it on linkedin and it's just a slightly yeah, different yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah it's a slightly different social platform but you know you go trying to find a common common ground of people that uh that are potential prospects and you've manage to navigate away and get them to talk to you and then build a relationship and hopefully do some business so they're yeah it's not totally alien to me but it's been good so far nice one and uh it's interesting you were saying there about a challenge and like uh like use you, your view is like all right there's a challenge we're gonna get crack into it versus when some people retire stop playing rugby they're like what do i do now like oh i don't know what i'm at I, who am i what am i doing but you sound here you're like fuck i'm gonna go after it i'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> yeah so yeah so uh, this is that that this feeling I've had now where I'm feeling very upbeat and optimistic and I feel like I can just charge forward at what's in front of me you know that's definitely not been the case ever since I've retired um I feel like I'm in a good position now because I've been given a brilliant opportunity in a great company and um I've set up my own business as well and you know the apprentice is behind me now that's kind of been hanging over my head for the past six months and how would I be presented on that so I'm in a position now where I can charge into this challenge like make it happen and that's that was the great thing about playing it's like you're so sure on what you want to do you're like I really want to play professional rugby I don't want to do anything else so like whatever I need to do to make this a success I'll do it like be it train an extra hour get my diet right like sacrificing the nights out I kind of feel like I've got that now, but I can totally empathize with with guys who take a while to find that, right? Like I I stepped away from the job I was in to do The Apprentice last summer and I thought I was taking 12 weeks off to go and, and do this amazing experience or this journey and crashed out after two and then I was kind of left at a loose end and I went back to Ireland and kind of questioned whether I was in, what I was in the right job at the time and I was at a loose end and that's when you're going even if I wanted to be energetic and throw myself in something I've nothing to throw myself at here I'm just like yeah. family business is a pub like can't do that it's closed um I was feeling sorry for myself about what had happened I didn't have my own business set up 
Um, so it was like, it's it's easy to sound like I do now where I'm like, right, I'm really focused and I'm in this. But to an extent, you need to have the opportunity and you need to have the platform to do that first. And that's, that's tough. And that's where I think I empathize with a lot of players that finding that break is the hard thing. I think most guys, like, loads of the skills are transferable and the mindset is so important. So, like, once they find their groove or find their niche, they'll make a success of it. It's just, you just got to get busy and put yourself out there to take some breaks to get yourself in that position. Yeah, fair play um, for us up on The Apprentice for going for that and for getting in. Like, that's class. Like, uh, fair play. How How was all that? <laughs> Yeah, it was it was a brilliant experience. I was loving it. I was I genuinely was good at it when it was over. And I think there's a very mixed um I think there's a very mixed perception of what it's like a lot of people look down on it and think it's a lot of rubbish and other people like would hold that opinion where it's like fair play to you for putting yourself out there and everyone's entitled to their own opinion, right? And I yeah, actually yeah, respect yeah. and I understand both sides of it because you do look at it and it's totally chaotic. Um, but it was just one of those things. I just I always watched it. I always thought it looked like a lot of fun, um, and something that I thought I'd be quite good at. Like these shows get you to engage, right? They like get you thinking. What would I do in these situations? And I was like, I could definitely do a better job. And given my background of sport, I was like, there's a good chance I'll put myself forward for this. I get it. <clears throat> and it was funny. I remember getting to like one of the final stages of the audition and one of the producers was like, why should we pick you for this show? And I said, listen, every year you've got a token Irish person and a washed up sports athlete. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can kill two birds at one stone with me. <laughs> and uh, the two of them just burst out laughing and they were like, I think there's going to be a spot for you in this, this season's show. So, nice. yeah, to, to be honest, um, I actually... I kind of like applied for it the year previous when I just finished um, with my head and I was like, I hadn't really anything lined up and that was, that was progressing nicely. And then the show got called off and then the opportunity represented itself um, like eight or nine months later. And it wasn't as much of a straightforward decision the second time around because I had a, I had started my career and I felt like I probably had a little bit more to lose if that made sense. Yeah. <clears throat> but when I went home and I thought about it, I was like, look, I, this would be just something I regret if I don't do. And um, I am a risk taker by nature and I have a big believer in fortune favors the brave and it didn't really work out yeah. for me this time around. But um, I don't think I've lost anything from doing it. If anything, I'm just, I've got a good story to tell and it actually has, it, one, it gave me the impetus to go set up the business that I went on to the show with, with my with Topsy Ojo, and and two, um, it's actually been good for the business. Like I've, we've already got some bookings out of it, um, and yeah, it's 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 a good story to be told. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Like, and as I say, fortune favors the brave. Like taking chances, and like I think you know, all these people are just so afraid of failure. You know, people are so afraid of things not working out. And, and then I think the people that would begrudge someone doing something are the ones who'd be afraid to do it anyway. Agreed, yeah. One one of the things, like, I probably did, like, when I played, I had this mindset. So I was very worried about what everyone thought of me. Like, you know, I was always kind of thinking, I wonder what that coach, what that coach thinks of yeah. me. And I'll do my, like, do the lads that I'm playing with rate me and... You're always kind of like wondering what your perception is externally, yeah. And you know you have that's important in life that you have to have a certain self, a certain sense of self awareness. But and then I went on that show and then I crashed out early and I was like, oh, everyone's gonna think I'm an idiot. Like, why did I do that? And then I worked through that, you know, mentally, and I've kind of come to the conclusion that like. A lot of people don't give a shit. Like everyone's got their own stuff going on. Like no, yeah, that's uh, so no, true. no, that's so no true. one has no one has time to be like, yeah. Oh, I can't believe it. Might come up in a conversation over a pint. But no one's thinking. I can't believe Conor Gilson went on that show and he said that. Or like, no one cares. No one um, cares. 
<laughs> nobody cares like. everyone has their own shit going on you realize that yes everyone's so worried about all this shit that they've got going on exactly yeah and but i at the, like you can get yourself and not worrying about what other people think and it's just not helpful um and i also think it, you, you give off that five then as well and it's not it's not one that attracts a very positive energy if you're if you're second guessing yourself yeah. all the time so yeah, it's look. It it that it, it was it was definitely something that has helped me like mature a little bit. I think as well. Nice one. And do you think, um, like when you're playing like throughout, you know, that that kind of worrying about what coaches think? I get it. Like you know, you're will I be picked? Will I be not? Are they do they rate me? Do they not? Why did he say that to me? You know, you you do as a player kind of constantly think that. And like you say with the other lads, it's like. Do they rate me? Do they think I'm good? Do did that was that kind of did you have that kind of the whole way through? Or was there a time where it kind of became less so? I think it the whole way through, and I think it, it held me back a lot. Um I think probably the only time that I wasn't thinking it was was maybe in my last season at London Irish when uh there's a there's a a guy who was a couple of years ahead of me, who I familiar with, his name is Paul O'Donoghue. Yeah, um, nine. He was, yeah, he was nine. He, he yeah. played at Leinster and then at Connacht, um, like won the Heineken Cup. He was had a really good career, but he finished like maybe, uh, he finished about six years before me. And he would always, say, we used to kind of like, we weren't, we didn't really know each other when we played. I met him when I was down in Connacht and then, um, we're both living in London and kind of mingling in the same social circle. And he would always say to me, he's like, are you enjoying it? Like, and I'd be like, wound up about injury and selection and contracts. And he always be like, just make sure you enjoy it. And like, he'd always say it to me, I'd be like, it's just such a throwaway comment. Yeah. But then he actually like properly got my ear, you know, maybe in an off season leading into my last season, I think. And he was just like, you need to start enjoying it. Like he thought, I regret not enjoying it and like talking about these things where I get wound up about all the pressures that comes in professional rugby, right? Selection, mm. how you're perceived, uh, contracts. He's like, you can start enjoying it. Like it's, it's a really special time and you know, you go into the real world and you'll be great at that. But like, you want to look back on those times and be like thinking of a fond memories and not just constant stress and anguish. And, uh, yeah, I remember we were playing like a cup game, uh, in like so I think that season it, the, the the season started with like two or three cup games, and then it went into the Premiership, and we were playing like Gloucester away in a cup game, and we played a really we played quite a strong team, and they played like a young team, so we we beat them really convincingly, but like we played in Kings Home, it was packed, and it was like twenty degrees and we we're playing like really good rugby and I remember just looking around like we're actually smiling being like this is unbelievable like how how fucking cool and I actually yeah. if had he had not said that to me and actually managed to like get into my head about it like I think I probably wouldn't have like I would have been like because my whole thing was like I just seen myself as this like captain intensity just always driving standards, not letting lads get ahead of themselves. Um, so that was quite nice to be able to enjoy those moments. Um, and then like, yeah, I just remember any, any of the other games I played that season, I kind of, had, you know, I, my performance definitely didn't drop off. I was actually playing really good rugby, but I remember like when cool stuff was happening, when we'd score tries, when, you know, we'd, I, I'd actually take a moment and like, just let it soak in and like i i look at guys who kind of are in similar situations to me i'd never say this to guys who are like gone on and done amazing things like half the bloody lads i was in the academy with yeah, but geez. um who like play for ireland and the lions that i just don't even yeah. go there by telling them what to do but you know guys that i would have shared the change room with that you know wouldn't have played international rugby and are like probably in the same situation as me where they're kind of like scrapping for contracts and um i just try and get that same message across been like you know i don't know how I, only you know how long you have left but while you're still doing it like enjoy it like you're 
you've been paid to go to the gym and work out with your friends and people come to watch you do your job at the weekend like it's fucking cool um so when things are good when you're winning and you're playing the games at the weekend and it's sunny and you're you're not doing contact training like enjoy those moments because when it's when it's over it's over like there's no going back to it yeah it's such a brilliant message and um it's i think the way you say like about the guys who've gone further say the lines but i think it's the same at every level like i chat to people who play club rugby and and they get you know real nervous and they're not being paid but they're like just riddled with nerves and because that's their standard and you had your standard and then you talk about guys who go and play at the lines that's their standard i know guys like you do who are playing internationally who are still you know have a lot of anxieties and nerves around it but um was there anything that Paul O'Donoghue said to you that it kind of like actually clicked? Because I find that as well. I, I find trying to tell people as well, like enjoy it. Like I'm at a place now, I'm playing club rugby here locally. And I'm just like having the crack all the time. Just like, it's great, you know, enjoying it. Like, and it's like that you're just, you ball out. It's you're, you're so good when you're enjoying it. But um, is yeah. there anything that he said to you that it kind of clicked or? I, I think I kind of touched on it there. It was, it was just kind of saying that like this doesn't last forever and yeah no like I'm I, 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 I'm I just really hate the idea of having regrets and he kind of said like don't regret that like when when this does stop whenever it does um you know you don't want to be looking back and going it didn't and like it wasn't as if I didn't enjoy my career up to that like I loved it like I really did yeah. like I the environment like you know, we we weren't a super successful squad at London Irish when I was there, but I enjoyed the process of it, the day to day of being a rugby player. Like I enjoyed mm. the discipline of getting up early, you know, looking after well, to a certain extent that could have been better, but looking after what you're eating, uh, you know, doing your gym work, being diligent about learning your plays, uh, like the lifestyle that comes with it. Like I enjoyed the process of being a rugby player but I probably didn't like stop and just like let it soak in enough. I was always just like, what's next? What's next? What's next? Like, how can I get better? You know, even when, if I had a good game, I was really hard on myself in the review. I kind of wanted my coaches to be critical of me all the time. Um, so yeah, I thought, I thought oh, is, it, is it an Irish thing? Cause like, so I used to see like the Southern Hemisphere guys, the Australians and the Kiwis come up and like very much like a glass half full, like with how yeah. they play and how they they actually would be relaxed in the change room. I'm like, yeah. how the hell are you relaxed before this game? Like, I'm there like mm. banging my head against the wall, going, "Yeah, I need yeah. to get up for this." Yeah, and shit, like and like I was and like most of the guys that would have played with me when I was younger and like I was way too like vocal and amped up before games um, and as I got older I started to realise like it's just not really necessary like there is a time where of course you raise your voice and you get your message across but there's a lot to be said for just being like calm and focused and, and understanding what you got to do and then when things are going well enjoy it and then when they're not taking a deep breath and trying to fix it yeah it's something you mentioned earlier there, um, the way you're saying like that you were so intense. There was one thing when I was just when we were chatting, texting or whatever, I was just thinking back when we played together and against each other more so. But like the intensity you had, I think you were one of the most intense players I played with against. It was like, a, and I think it, it was a huge positive because you were captain in school, you were captain, we played Irish 19s, you were captain of that team, a lot of very good players. But like, did you did you feel that that was like a, like a, an extra skill like like you say that it was something that you had to be because because i looking at you back then i was like fuck he's good like look at how he is you know and it was yeah. did you feel that yeah it, i think i think it probably stood me in good stead when i was younger i think it, it probably was like a usp and be like oh, this guy is just he's really intense he knows what he's about but as actually as I got older and dealt with more coaches. I think it probably played against me. I think they kind of seen me as like a little bit one dimensional and not coachable. Like they kind of just go like that guy, all he wants to do is like hit rocks and tackle. Yeah. And he doesn't have that subtlety, that link play. 
Um, like, you know, there's like particularly like attack coaches, for example, like on a Monday or times on a Tuesday, like they want to like go through their plays and you know add add a coaching element to us. I all I wanted to do is bring intensity to everything. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, um, yeah, I was just like always wanted it to be like full metal jacket. Um and I think, you know, there's probably a balance with that. You know, you need to sure when like game time comes that like a coach and your teammates can rely on you to like bring a lot of intensity at the right time. But then being able to turn that dial up and down so that like coaches feel like you're quite approachable and coachable is um if I was to go back and do it again, I'd probably try and give that off a bit more. Um, but yeah, so like getting a bit sidetracked, I, I I definitely was a very intense player. I think I've given a lot of lads that I played with like probably some funny stories about me losing the head in change rooms and on the pitch. But that was kind of what, who I was when I was younger. I think it did kind of grow out of me a little bit, but it's probably still in there somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, no, it was definitely good because I remember like playing against you, be like this madman, like what's he gonna? It's like, geez, I don't know what he's gonna do. He could do anything. It's just like, you're just like, a, you're kind of wary, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, good memories, good memories. I don't I have to say, like the we used to play against each other quite a lot in school, but they're definitely like some of my fondest memories. Uh, looking back at it all, I don't know if that's a reflection of my professional career or or what, but. Uh, yeah, there was there was just something really special about schools rugby, and it it meant a lot to a lot of people. And it was quite unique how everyone's just pulling in the same direction. Everyone wants it the same way. Like obviously, when you go professional, it, money adds complexity to it, right? Um, mm. But there was something very very pure and very likable about schools rugby. Yeah, because schools rugby is like it's like full on. It's a it's full on professional, but you're just not getting paid. Like you've got you're training all the time. You're in the gym. You've got coaches. You're it's the same, isn't it? It, it yeah. And Leinster are so are so lucky. Well, I know they they feed into it themselves, but they are so they effectively have eight or ten academies dotted around their dotted around the province training these guys up to be professionals when from, from their when they're 14 like I think back to my time in Clongos we used to um, from let's say when we got to senior cup level we're in like fourth fifth and sixth year like we'd get up we'd do weights in the morning go to class we'd train in the afternoon and then a lot of the time, the lads would go out and play tag rugby at night time. Like, yeah. It's like three sessions a day. We might play two games a week. We'd have a day off on a Sunday and we'd go again. And uh, yeah, and everyone just loved it. Like it was, well, not everyone, but most of the guys loved it. And it gives you every opportunity to, to be a professional if that's what you want to do. Yeah. And did you, you mention earlier, like, said I always wanted to be a professional did you kind of realize like at a youngish age or at some point then when you were in Klang was like this is what I'm going to do yeah I remember I was quite I, I loved my my Gaelic before I went to Klang so I was kind of doing oh, I pretty much did everything when I was younger and that's anytime you get asked that question what advice would you give people when they're younger it's just like do as many sports as you can for as long as possible 100%. because they all train different parts with different different skills hand eye uh car yeah. fitness strength based like there's just so much to try and loads of different skills and then 100%. you'll find out pretty quickly what you're best at <clears throat> but yeah i was like i love my gaelic and then went to clongos and then i got into got pretty big into rugby at that point and i just remember like the first cup season came around and i just found the whole thing like really inspiring um the buzz around the place, how everyone looked up to the lads on the team. And they're all they were actually all really good role models around school as well. That was the thing. They're like um and it was a it was a good school. But I pro I can't remember. I think we had like a good senior cup team when I was uh when I was kind of first second year and then I think around second or maybe second year I was in the junior panel and it didn't go that well for me and then third year 
I moved from full back into second row and I was made captain that year and we won it for the first time in like 50 years. And then at that point, yeah. I was like, right, this is what I want to do. Like, I didn't really want to be in the classroom. All I wanted to do was be in the rugby pitch. Um, so, yeah, I probably set my, <clears throat> my stall out on it then. But a big part of the reason why it probably happened was because I was surrounded. One, because the environment was is, it does like it does nurture um a lot of really good talent like Congress have had so many Irish internationals and guys have done on to great gone on to do great things in the rugby um in the rugby world. But that's one thing and then I, I was really fortunate. I had like an amazing group of players around me. I had like Tyne Byrne was on my team, uh Brian and Ed Byrne were on my team, Jordan Coughlin, Nick McCarthy, David Quirk. Max McFarlane has gone on to play sevens for mm-hmm. Scotland. Like, there's so many good guys around me. So, like, it's easy to stand out in that environment. And then we had good coaches. Like, I know you had no Mac on this recently. He was, like, a proper mentor, amazing coach, and a really good teacher to us in the school. So, uh, like I said, you're kind of set up for success if you want to go after it and try and make it happen. Yeah. And you mentioned there junior cup. We also had our best team about fifty years. But you beat us in the semi final. I know <laughs> we kept going yeah. head to head. I remember, oh. it, and then we went. Then we went head to head in the final as well. Yeah, but, I, I, I left the school at that stage. Yeah, but oh, yeah, did you? All oh, right. I was a year ahead. Where did, where did you go? Because I no, I was a year ahead. I was in Ty playing junior, and oh, I remember right. we were like we beat like we beat Blackrock, beat all these, and it was like this Congo series with you and those lads was like. They're good, Macaulay as well, and um, yeah, Steve was we, good. Steve yeah. was awesome in school, yeah, yeah. And we Os- like, Oscar and Gard Asulo oh, were very good. They stayed back, yeah. Ridiculous. We were like, yeah. we have a chance here. We've, oh, we're, we could, we're gonna do it, boys. And then like first, oh, you just scored two, three tries, and it was just like, geez, these guys are different level. Yeah, we're good. that was mad. Yeah. So where are you? So you were the year ahead. So then you wouldn't have played the same when you were in sixth year. year. Yeah, when you were so in sixth Connor, year, I was Connor Finn. Yeah, Lado, those boys. Yeah, yeah, no, and yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So then, like, then say we, we were Leinster schools together, and you didn't make the twenty three, but then, like, came roaring back, like, won the cup, played for Ireland underage, then started captain. But setbacks, like, and you've had tons more than afterward injuries in your pro career. But did setbacks, like, say, even at a young age like that, did that not kind of stop you? In your, it didn't stop you in your tracks, but. How how did you kind of come back from those? Um, yeah, I, I did have setbacks. I think it's it's pretty common though for for a lot of rugby players, particularly guys who play in the back row, to to get a lot of injuries. Like I remember, I remember having maybe a little bit of a moan uh, with with Sean O'Brien about you know I was always injured kind of thing. And I was telling him about all my surgeries and. He kind of stopped me in my tracks and was like, lad, I've had like 20 operations. Wow. <laughs> and I was like, wow. I was like, right. Yeah, and you really just stopped giving out now. Um, so yeah, it is, it's, it's, I think it's par for the course. It's pretty common. I did have quite a few, like, yeah, probably there's there a couple of ones that I felt like really set me back. Like I had a really good first year in the academy at Leinster and I had a good year playing Irish 20s. And we were over at the World Cup and we beat South Africa in the first game. We were playing England in the second game and it was like, I was like we could win this when we beat South Africa. And then we were like, I'm going 14 nil up or something. And again, we had a really good team. We had JJ was on that team, Ian Henderson, Jack Conan, uh, just to name a few. Like it was low, yeah. yeah, Tig, like all these it's guys insane. have gone on to do yeah. incredible things since. Here, Marmy um, and Jack, yeah. Yeah, ridiculous. Luke McGrath was on it as well. Um, crazy, crazy team. But I just remember, yeah, like some guy fell on my leg and I like fractured my ankle and done this endosmosis and I was just out for ages with it. And I just didn't really get any momentum going in my second year and third year, like I got a knee injury then as well. Yeah, so it just, it just felt like I was just like never really managed to pick get a vein of, like a vein of form after that when I was at Leinster. And then ended up leaving. So I was I was pretty good with that at the time, to be honest. Like you, mm. you go into that system and you see it's it's pretty inspiring. Again, all around you, you're just surrounded by Irish internationals and 
guys who are just at the top of their game and it's an incredibly competitive environment it's something you want to be a part of so when that door was closed on me i was like yeah pretty good at the time hmm. so you're about 2021 20, and then did you kind of find out six months because you went you went to Connacht for three four months then didn't you yeah yeah I went obviously to... the highlight of your, of your career I actually loved my time down in Galway. I really, really did. Uh, it was made easy because I knew so many lads like Jack and Jack and Heffo and Marcus and Finner. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was loads of guys down there. Maybe feel welcome. And I actually got on really well with Pat Lamb as well. But yeah, I went down there, made my senior debut. Actually, I can't really remember. I can't remember if there was no contract there for me or it was just like maybe it was a, a, another year in their academy. Um but I had a, a had a senior contract in in London Irish, and I was like, "Look, I just think this is a really good opportunity." I got to London. I loved the Irish affiliation with it, and yeah, you know, the plan. To be honest, totally honest, like the plan was that, right, I'll just go over here, I'll just play, I'll smash it, and then come back to one of the provinces and go play for Ireland. But that didn't that didn't transpire. <laughs> um, but I lo- I absolutely love my time at London Irish. Like I said, I it's it's a really good club, and it was frustrating because we yo-yoed between the leagues, and we just never really hit our straps. And then they got rid of the Deadwood two years ago, and now they're starting to creep their way up the table. <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, it, it worked out for the best uh, for definite because I feel like I'm in a a good place to, to, to do well post rugby now and I'm not sure I would have been as well equipped or I thought I've stayed if I stayed in Dublin. Uh it's just there's just so much opportunity and um lots of yeah there's just lots of things to be explored from a business perspective here that uh it's on your doorstep and people are very willing to help if you if you put yourself out there. Nice one. Kind of got you outside of your comfort zone, say, like, I know what you mean in that, like, if you stay in the same place, you have been all the time and you just keep doing the same thing. But what, when you went to, because I saw when you were with Irish, didn't you start doing a bit of work while you were still playing? Did I see that in your LinkedIn? Like, you started kind of looking into things outside of rugby while you were still right in the thick of it. Yeah, that, yeah. So I, I, um, when I got my degree first, because I didn't manage to finish it when I was in, in Dublin. And and then I went to, I set up a, a tech. Well, I didn't set it up. One of my friends set up a tech company, and he brought me on board as a, as a shareholder on it. So I kind of got the whole feel of being like a tech startup Ooh. founder. And that was, we done that for two and a half, three years, um, and that was a brilliant experience. Like really get kind of wet the appetite for going into business. I set up an events company with another friend from Dublin. We threw brunch parties in a. Uh, in London, Dublin, and in, in Portugal, and that was brilliant, but it didn't lend itself very well to playing rugby. No, <laughs> um, getting on the mimosas at eleven. <laughs> no, <it wasn't laughs> throwing parties at the weekend and then showing yeah. up the training on the Monday. Uh, so we we nipped that in the bud pretty quickly, but again, it just kind of gave me an appetite for making money. You're going right, how like how do I like leverage kind of your network and the people you know and put something on that they want to go to. So that was good, and then I kind of was like, right, this the like tech and events are kind of what I want to be in, and then done some work experience working on like rugby sevens festivals, and I go into the city and try and like I'd spent days in like in Dropbox and then LinkedIn, I tried to do that on, like a semi regular basis. <clears throat> so then when the time came that the doctors were like, look, this isn't for you anymore because of the the injury, it didn't feel like I was at a stand and start. I was like, look, I'm been in the city I've, I've kind of met loads of people who do the types of roles that i want to get into and i think with a, if someone takes a punt on me and like buys into me and gives me a bit of time that i can be just as good as those people so um yeah it's all worked out reasonably okay so far yeah good stuff and so when you say going into like um linkedin dropbox like for a day or two how how did that come about so did you use the- you just kind of were like, all right, this is what I want to get into. And you just want to get a bit of experience. And did you like it on them or how, how did you do that? So you'd probably be familiar with like the, the rugby players association in Ireland. Oh yeah. <clears throat> so it's like the players union and they're, they're really brilliant, really proactive. They were brilliant when I was there in the academy. 
I really enjoyed, uh, you know, the, the co-curricular stuff they would do with you to, they would primarily just kind of push you towards education, which is what I'd done at the time. And then when you get a little bit older, like it's important if you don't want, like if you finish your education or if you maybe if you don't want to do education, that they create other opportunities for you. And the same applies in, in the UK. They have a, um, a group called the RPA who are really, really good with that. Um, so, you know, I went to them, told them what I was interested in. And I think, you know, these groups can come in for quite a lot of um, criticism sometimes. Guys like, well, they don't, they don't help me. Like, you haven't given me any opportunities. But he's kind of one of definitely one of those things that it's, they're on, you only get as much out as what you put in. Or like, mm. it, it won't just fall on your lap like anything in life. You kind of have to go yeah. and hassle them and tell them what you want to do and figure out who the right person to speak to is about your things. And then they might be able to connect you into these people. So, they were that was that was really good for me and then um, to help me um kind of transition out of it as well which has been good but it's been tough for them because with all the, the stuff that's been going on since covid started with pay cuts and um, pay cuts and like players contracts being a little bit not exactly being honored um oh yeah you know they they're, they're coming in for quite a lot of criticism at the minute but I haven't really been part of that, so I can't really pass much judgment on it. Yeah, it's uh, and it's the same in like amateur as well. Like, um, it's a great point you make about having to go and get it, as in all these clubs as well. Like, it's the same in Ireland when I was at Lansdown or these different clubs are now in North America as well. Like, they want to help you, you know, or they want to help people, you know, these older guys or whatever. And it's, I for a good few years, you try and do everything on my own and try and. And it's like not asking for help. And once you do, like you got to, if you want to, like you say, you want to go into tech, do this. And you start saying, hey, can I get this? Can I get this? Can I get this? They'll help you out. And it's, I don't know, people in nearly, I think any rugby club I've been in, Ireland, Canada, America, they're they're the same. Like, you know, they'll help you, but you got to go and look they'll for put it. put yourself out there. Yeah, 100%. I think you need to be shameless about it, right? At times. You do. You're like hassling yeah. people, yeah. Yeah, it's probably why I found myself in sales. I've no problem putting my hand out and asking for stuff. <laughs> yeah, and uh, talk about the bar then. So the bar I saw outside the stadium. There's a Brentford Community Stadium with at an Irish game. Yeah, so I grew up in a publican household. My dad, uh, my mum and dad, they have uh, two businesses. They have a uh, the pub business and they have an undertaker's business, um, which is qu- quite unique. Next, next. But, yeah, I grew up. Grew, grew up in a in a hospitality background, so always kind of had a, an appetite for it. But never really, well, since I've moved over to London, I haven't really wanted to, to go back and, and run the pub in Mullingar. So when London when London Irish were moving from Reading into Brentford, which is West London, you know, there's a lot of there was a lot of excitement around that move because the idea would be that it's easier to tap into like the exile nation or the expats community when the games are on their doorstep. Like it's, it was quite Mm. difficult for London Irish to market to like the London crowd and say, Hey, we're like a London team, but we're playing an hour outside of London and it's not that easy to get to by public transport either. So that was always a big challenge for them when they moved. They, they used to play at the stoop, or no, the Avenue, which was Sunbury and had done really well there, had a brilliant crowd. It built an infamous reputation for being a great place to go for crack, good rugby, and, and a bit of networking as well. And they moved to the Stoop, and I think they were do pulling bigger crowds than Quinn's in their home turf, so they got kicked out of there pretty quickly. And then they moved to Majeski, but they were really successful at that time, so they were pulling big crowds. And then as the performances started to drop a little bit, the crowds dropped with them. And... I felt that the only solution was to get back into London. And I think it's been a really smart move and one that has shows the early signs show that it's it's going to be a really successful move for them. But when that happened, I was like, right, there's a really good opportunity here to like set up a player's bar near the stadium. And I was kind of looking around Brentford at the time and I got wind that Topsy was doing the same thing. And I was like, right, well, this sat down. And I was like, look, there's no point in the two of us trying to pull 
in two different directions and try and pull the same crowd. Mainly because he'd win because he's <laughs> London Irish legend, <laughs> and I'd be forgotten the second I walk out of place. Um, but he was like, "Yeah, sounds good." And then we we're looking at these places, and they were just like eye-wateringly expensive, and kind of asking ourselves the question: Do we really want to get tied into like a, a lease or buying a property? Plus, where would we get the money from? And uh, then we got inspired by the guys in Saracens who've got like the Wolfpack Bar and they've built an unbelievable business off the back of this, but they've got their own liquid, which they pour, or their own beer, I should say. And they've got a double-decker bus at Saracens. So it's like a player's bar for the fans. And it's really, really cool. So I was like, let's try and do something like this. And we, we pitched it initially to London Irish and they loved it. They were like, the CEO got behind it, Mick Cross and, uh, and Ed, they got behind it. And we were like, right, this has, they were like, this definitely has legs. You know, it's kind of what the club needs, like that attachment to like the older players. And then we pitched it to Brentford Community Stadium and they were on board as well because they own the stadium and London Irish are tenants. And they said, yeah, this is something we'd be open to, but the double decker bus is just a bit much. Like, let's like, just kind of make it smaller. So. We, we we went online, had a little look around, and we're like, that Land Rover looks really cool. We could stick six taps on the side of that. And then that covers off our Guinness and our beer and our cider. Like, we need something to supplement that. The horse box are they're pretty commonplace these days, but they're still cool. They still add a, a unique kind of artisan feel to, to any live event. And so we got the two of them. They, uh, there's actually a funny story behind this. We... We'd, we'd done a test run like the day before our first event and uh, we were driving back out the motorway from the stadium back to where we keep the, the truck at the club and Topsy was driving he's like there's an awful lot of rattling going on in the background there like what's going on I'm like looking in the uh, the wing mirror I'm like it's fine it's just an old horse box <laughs> and the next yeah. thing massive like jolt we're kind of like <laughs> and, uh, um, wheel comes off of and starts like bouncing down the the motorway and oh, like geez. we're going like going like 60 miles an hour so it's pretty fast and oh. there's like three lanes and it's bouncing on the motorway and we're like looking at this it's honestly like something from Final Destination and <laughs> <laughs> like bounces over the first car oh. like like car is swerving everywhere hits li- luckily kind of like rolls off onto like a hard shoulder and I jump out get the wheel tops his like he's Jesus. so shook as am I I'm kind of I kind of see the funny side of it, but I guess he's driving he feels a little more shook and we kind of roll the the horse box back because we, we could still drive it it was just like a bit unsafe on three wheels we got, we, yeah we got we got we got it back <laughs> we got it back to the club and i'm i'm ringing the guy that's made it. i'm like you fucking come fix this thing like we got an event tomorrow uh Your first one yeah, was, yeah honestly it was kind of like <laughs> felt like i was being back in the apprentice where just everything was everything that could go wrong would go wrong but yeah that's all that's all kind of part of the fun of running a business and doing it for the first time like these mistakes happen you just kind of got to laugh it off and hopefully thankfully no one got hurt or didn't hit any cars that would have been a disaster yeah jeez. and so then you you got that crack and then you you put it up outside <laughs> the stadium on match days and there's a i saw there's a big kind of like scene photos big kind of area or whatever and then so that goes around to other events yeah, so we go we go to all the Irish home games uh, at, at present, and then we, you know we're we're looking to expand that into to other stuff. So w- what have we got in the pipeline? We're looking at doing the the Chelsea women's games coming up soon in Kings Meadow, which would be pretty cool. Um, we're doing a couple of food and drink festivals this summer, which will be which will be brilliant. One of them is uh, in the same in the Chelsea Royal Hospital, which is the same venue as the Chelsea Flower Show. We're doing some other like sports and fitness events during the summer that I can't really name because we haven't signed the contract yet. But yeah, the, the rugby is the starting point. 
Cool. And we want to grow it out from there. You know, old, the the end goal is to is to have a few Land Rovers, is to have like a fleet of trucks that like go to create these unique um, event experiences. And you know, it's like we've got a pretty unique story to go behind this. But like, I'd love to be in Glastonbury doing the Six Nations at Twickenham, yeah. doing the London Irish games, maybe do the Brentford football games as well. And then all of a sudden, you've got a really serious business. But it's definitely been a learning curve. Um, I wouldn't say it's like we're not going to be rich overnight. To put it that way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I think that I think that's that's pretty. I think I think most entrepreneurs who start a business would say the same thing like they have all these lofty ambitions and you, you do all these cash forecasts and you're like this is a hell of a business and then you get like a bit of a rude awakening um a couple of months in but it's it, it, it is it's it's really enjoyable i've learned i've learned loads from it already like um like you know simple <laughs> simple stuff like how to do like we use zero for our accountancy like doing the remittance and reconciliation afterwards it's like you actually be, get a taste of what it's like to run a business like there's all yeah. the boring stuff that goes behind it and um building out decks to send to all these festivals and following up with people and having to do like all these health and safety certs and personal alcohol licenses and making sure that the insurance is up to scratch um there's just so much to it that at the start, I was like, "This would be so cool." We just drive our Land Rover up here and like sell loads of beers and have a great yeah. time. And it's just, it's just not that straightforward. Like the game days are, are a long slog. Like we get up, me and Topsy get up at like, like half five, six o'clock. We're like load, like, like loading up the, the Land Rover and the horse box with stock. <clears throat> filling up the the cooler getting that turned on like getting up all the branding getting the the cups ready and then like by the time we lock up it's like eight nine o'clock that night so it's like it's a Jeez. full it's a it's a long old day like you're not you're not in the mood to go partying or anything after you're just going home and ordering a pizza and chilling out <laughs> Yeah, it, yeah, it's glamorous when you see the photos, like lovely sunny day, the pitch behind you, having a few pints. But uh, yeah, you don't yeah, see all the other side of it. it. Yeah, I, I, I actually, I got, I go back out to the club a lot more now, which is that's actually been one of the really nice things about it. It's kept me connected to London Irish, which probably felt like I was growing a little bit distant from it. So it's kind of kept me connected to the game and to the club. But the guys see me and I'm out there like with my marigolds on scrubbing the back of the Land Rover and cleaning the lines and it's just like yeah. <laughs> they're, they're going out to train and they're going jeez I think I think I'll hang on in here for another couple of years <laughs> a couple more years out of this yeah yeah and um, it's funny you say there about it. it's how important it is as well to have a to dream big and have a big goal like like you say when you're starting that you know you're starting that yeah. and you've one truck or whatever you know you're starting off but you're like I want to do this at some point and the same with playing and like with, with anything you do, you gotta, you gotta have that kind of big aspiration, don't you? Else you'll, if you don't think big, you'll, nothing will happen. Nothing will come, but no. Yeah, I, I'm trying to get better at like setting, you know, I kind of just, I do that, do exactly that. I just dream big. I just have like big thoughts in my head all the time, but I don't, I need to get better at like writing these things down, planning my goals, putting them, yeah, like setting my goals, setting the, um the lofty ambitions but then putting a plan in place to get there like i kind of just like get these ideas in my head and i just trudge forward trying to get there and it could probably be a little bit more calculated about doing these things um like there's a couple of festivals that we that we're gonna do this summer and i haven't modeled it out at all i'm just like that looks sick let's just do it yeah (laughs) like they're pretty expensive pitch fees but i'm like it'll be fine We'll make this work. We'll get loads of people down there. The sun will be shining. Um, and then Topsy's like, are you sure? Like, let's just sit there and model sure. it. Like, no, no, <laughs> it's fine. If, if it doesn't work out, we'll learn from it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good. So fair, fair play and best look at it going forward. Um, you've been really your time. But before, what was the injury? Like, I know there's a good few, but what was the one then that kind of um, that finished off? It was a concussion, um, so I think it's becoming 
probably a little bit more common now. But yeah, I played against. It's probably isn't a good endorsement for the guy. I can't even remember who I played against. <laughs> It was a French team. It could have been like Bayonne potentially in the Challenge Cup. And yeah, it was just, I think I was, uh, I was out in a five man line out. And they had like their two big ball carrying back rowers out in the thing. It was just, um, went up and he, it was a big old collision and he just, his shoulder caught my temple. And I was, I had that like, tonic posturing on the floor and was was out for a, a while like not crazy long but I was unconscious for a little bit and then had amnesia for um, a long time like definitely an hour or so I kind of came around in the change room I think I might have had the gas on my mouth and stuff so it's pretty it's pretty shit like I, watching it back is not nice um, and yeah it just kind of stirred up a a lot of problems for me afterwards that I didn't even get like I honestly didn't even get close to getting back down. Um, it was I was a million miles away from it. But yeah, that was that was the one that kind of finished it for me. Um, yes, good shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just good shit, like but... return to play. Like you, you go through like these like return to plays, and it just you get headaches, and it just doesn't. You just don't get back. Yeah. That was crap. Yeah. How's the body now? Are you like work are you like work out, exercise? <clears throat> um yeah, yeah, I'm I'm trying to keep as fit as possible really. I, I was training for a marathon uh last year. I've done a half marathon in March and I was training for the full one. Jeez, uh, fair play. Uh in November and I actually rolled my ankle on a bloody curb ruptured like some liquids my ankle I was I thought I left this life be- I thought I left this life behind me that's the next I'm phase just... now it's like you're a weekend warrior like getting yeah. rolling ankles <laughs> on curbs <laughs> yeah exactly that yeah so that that brought that to a close pretty quickly but yeah I've like I've lost I, I used to play like around 105 106 kilos and down around 92 now I'd like to be like kind of sub 90 and I'm gonna do a marathon this year, definitely. Nice. And yeah, keeping fit. I tried to. I tried like I do notice as well, like because it's become so ingrained in you to the train, and it becomes such a part of a habit in your life when you play. Like you just train, and it's that natural endorphin hit, and it's like yeah, therapeutic for your like mindset and everything. You don't. You actually you rely on it so much, and like I noticed that if like two days go by and I don't train that like I'll be sitting on my desk I'll be really irritable not thinking straight um but then if I like get up and I start my day and I get to the gym first thing and I do a weight session I do a bit of a like a blow before I sit down at my desk everything's just so much easier like yeah I don't get stressed I don't like get things pile up on me as much um it's there, there is like just so much to be said for it like um, it's funny like I chat with my parents obviously they're a lot older <laughs> like it, Rich from me like a, a guy a fit young guy in his 20s telling his parents to work out but I'm, I'm always going home like you guys exercising you going out for walks and stuff Cause if, if they're in cranky mood and they're just like no and I'm like you need to like it's like yeah. it, honestly there's a direct correlation between like your mood and like your everything, like everything, your mood, your positivity, your um, your productivity to ha- to working out. Like there's just like I'm a massive advocate for that, and uh, I try to build it into my day as much as possible. A hundred percent, it's so true. And I kind of went through a similar phase where I stopped working out or got injured, and then was just like not working out. And you just you just feel so shitty. You're you're just in a bad place. And I'd say 
I was the exact same with my parents. I'd say they were so sick of me listen, listening to me telling them that they just started. I'd say that was it. They're like, this fella is right, not going to yeah. stop annoying me. So you've actually managed to, get, to crack it, yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't think I'll ever crack my dad for it because, you know, he's just an industrialist. Like, he's, his working out is working hard um, with the funerals and the pub. But mom, mom used to do it, and uh, I think if I keep persisting with her, she'll get jump back on the bandwagon. Uh, yeah, yeah, hopefully. Good stuff. Hey, bud, thanks a minute for your time. Been unreal chatting. I know it's late there in London. Um, yeah, but yes. <sighs> yeah, really enjoyed it. Good stuff. Uh, so let me know where people can find the bar, the three one bar, and, and all that stuff. <clears throat> yeah. So, like I was saying, you know the. The, the big loft, the ambition is to get into Twickenham and to do the London Irish games and Glastonbury and the Brentford games. But in between that, you know, we, we do private events. You know, off the, this summer, we've got like two weddings booked in, two birthdays, a corporate event. So those private bookings are definitely a big part of the business. Um, it's called the 301 Bar. If you want to check it out, we're on Instagram. We've got our own website. You can do some inquiries in there um and yeah if, if if anyone's got any private events uh public events live sporting events music whatever it is please get in contact uh we'd love to bring the bar to the to, to the party good stuff and that's all around london yeah 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 so we've got a couple of events just outside of london um but uh, yeah it kind of drives the the land rover and the horse box it kind of drives like a tractor so yeah <laughs> anything, anything <laughs> above like yeah anything above uh anything above like a two or three hour journey is is probably not feasible yeah 